So the the JWAS wrapper response font was uh, was called into action to provide if you want to emergency funding for projects that uh, really need it in this time and that due to also the whole situation, the whole COVID situation and uh, the pressure that puts on existing funding, we're really at the risk of not being able to do certain things that are really important and necessary for the system of scholarly communication. So. Funding is uh, provided uh, with many thanks uh, by the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative, Macrosref, Hypothesis, Ithaca, and IOR itself. And in total, there was 50,000 uh, US dollars to, uh, to distribute. We put out an open call to ask for, for proposals. Um, deliberately did not want a long, drawn out, um, extensive uh, application procedure, but really a short procedure, quick decisions uh, to be able to provide quick funding to a number of initiatives. The criteria for uh, in the decision making was um, for funds uh, for applications to be aligned with open practices and principles to uh, distribute, uh, uh, to demonstrate evidence for need of funding at the present time uh, and evidence of impact on the applicant and the wider open scholarly community. So we had an award committee that consisted of Daniel Robinson, Juan Pablo Alperin, uh, myself, uh, Ian Rinaskovic, and I did not check my, the pronunciation of your name beforehand, with which I apologize, uh, Greg Tannenbaum from the Open Research Funding Group, Caitlin from IOI, and Vanessa Weinsmith. And um, there were, of course, hard decisions because basically all these projects that applied deserved, um, deserved this money. But uh, we had to make choices, we made choices. So we have a number of awardees and I'll hand over to Ian to, um, to take it from here. And just Thanks. tell me, just tell me yeah. to, uh, when to move forward. Yeah, if you go to the next slide, uh, we, we received around 50 applications um, and as Bianca said, we, uh, we've awarded eight and um, we were really encouraged and pleased with the diversity in the applications in, in different ways. So we, we've got different types of projects um, that, that, that have been awarded, technical tools, uh, things focused on scholarly communication, reproducible research, and also a lot of human or, or, or certainly definite inclusion of, of human infrastructure uh, as, as we viewed it. Um, also, diversity in research disciplines and research communities, so from sciences, STEM subjects, to social sciences and humanities, and also uh, diversity in terms of geography as well. Three different continents uh, are represented in, in the eight awardees that um, you're going to hear a bit more about. Um, so on to the next slide. And so... Yay, these are the, the, um, the eight projects that, uh, that have been successful. I'm gonna give you a quick flavor of, of what each of them are about. And we actually have six uh, representatives um, from six of the projects um, who actually are going to um, say a few words themselves as well. So um, the, the first project is La Referencia. Um, so also known as the Federated Network of Institutional Repositories of Scientific Publications. Um, so Lava Referencia is a Latin American network of open access repositories. Uh, it's a discovery service for the open access outputs of Latin America, uh, which harvests from repositories and publishing platforms across the continent. Uh, they've been advancing the adoption of common usage statistics in Latin America. And one of the reasons they were seeking funding was to build out those uses, statistics and metrics, which could provide regional users uh, of their platforms with better analytics and dashboards uh, to understand research impact and go beyond things such as the, the impact factor. Uh, the next one is OpenScapes. Uh, so this uh, helps principal investigators and their research groups reimagine data analysis. Uh, develop modern skills and cultivate collaborative and inclusive research teams. They do this primarily through something called OpenScape's Champions, uh, and that's a remote mentorship program that guides teams through the open data science landscape. And that's a good example of that, that human infrastructure um, that, that's been recognized in this, in this funding scheme. Um, 
Also, uh, pre-review, uh, their mission is to bring more diversity to scholarly peer review by supporting and empowering communities of researchers to review preprints. Um, so the backbone of pre-review is a platform for resources, reviews, and the community. Um, so fitting in with, the, with that collaborative theme of, our, of, our, of the conference, um, they're working with open access publishers to bring communities together to rapidly review COVID-19 manuscripts and to implement new workflows that integrate community reviews of preprints to the journal organized peer review process. Um, SK Time, um, not sure if I'm pronouncing that one, that one right. Um, so this uh, provides a unified, a unified Python framework for machine learning with time series. And their mission is to make the ecosystem more usable and interoperable by building a connected community of users developers and domain experts. Within the last 18 months, they've generated on average 200 unique visits to their GitHub page each day. And they've got a community of more than 60 contributors that's growing and, and they want to maintain that capacity uh, to continue onboarding and supporting their diverse, uh, their, their diverse membership. Africa Archives, so this is the African open access and preprint portal. It was launched in June, 2018 and it's looking um, always looking for the most relevant online infrastructure to adapt and live up to the requirements and expectations of the African scholarly community uh, through building an open, transparent, reliable, efficient and decentralized infrastructure. Uh, their aim is to support the connectivity of African scholars uh, and African scholarship to a wider audience. And they're looking to support their long term planning and, and, and funding efforts. 2i2c, uh, so this organization runs online interactive computing environments for researchers and educators. These are community hubs that provide interactive Jupyter interfaces along with connections to cloud infrastructure. Currently they're running a pilot project to serve these hubs to a number of educational institutes and uh, work on a sustainability model. Um, so they're really seeking to develop their, their educational infrastructure uh, with, with the award. Uh, penultimate um, awardee to congratulate is Humanities Commons. Um, this is an open source, open access, academy owned and governed research network facilitating collaboration and communication for more than 25,000 scholars and practitioners across the humanities and around the world. Uh, they want to bring their systems and plugins up to date um, and do that with minimal impact on their network. And finally, um, congratulations to the Knowledge Equity Lab. Um, so this is a research, learning and experimental space that investigates issues on how inclusive knowledge infrastructure could be built and sustained by and for diverse communities with diverse research pr practices and dissemination needs. This includes uh, the open access publishing platform Bioline International, which makes visible scientific journals published in the South. And they're aiming to support fundraising for long-term sustainability. Um, so on behalf of the awards committee, the program committee, congratulations to, to all of the awardees. Um, and I think if we have the next slide, we have um, the order of, um, of speakers um, to opportunity to say a few words. Um, a bit more about uh, about their projects and perhaps what the what the award is going to help support. Um, Lautaro, if if you're there, we can we can um, make you make you presenter or, yeah. or, or listen to your talk. No, uh, I'll I stop sharing that's... my screen. Yes. <laughs> okay, I, I I I will not present. Uh, I I, I, I not, will not present the slides, but I will speak a little bit about uh, La Referencia. First of all, I am Lautaro Matas. Executive and Technical Secretary of La Referencia. First, I want to say thank you very much to Gerolz, to the, our committee and all the founders that made this possible. Uh, La Referencia, as you mentioned, is an initiative supported by governments of 11 countries. Our main mission is to give visibility to the publicity funded scientific production in Latin America, intended as a public uh, good. good. Uh, so we we work in software, but also work in agreements between within the governments. We try to to reach agreements between the governments, and we work uh, very close to other international partners as core and open air. In fact, uh, in 2020, we deployed this uh, pilot on in usage statistics service 
with a representative sample of the Latin American repositories. And it, that was part of La Referencia participation in the Opener Advanced Project. But the project ends uh, in, the, in the next month. So due to the COVID situation in our countries, it was hard to raise funds to continue the work. So this award is, is, is important for us because it will support our efforts to continue this work in the next year uh, in order to develop more open source components and consolidate the pilot, hopefully in a production service for Latin America. So we are looking forward to present that, these outcomes in the next year. So thank you very much uh, for the hour and the opportunity to continue our work. Thank you, thank you, Lautaro. Um, next, we have, um, I think, do we have Joe from the Africa Archive team or another member of the team? Um, I'm here, I'm here, Joy, and Joe will also say something as well. Hi. 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 Great. Hi. <laughs> Go uh, for it. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's an honor to receive that award. Um, what, what we will, uh, Africa Archive, with, with the objective of, of increasing research visibility and output coming out of the continent, this comes a long way in helping in setting up our systems to support uh, our infrastructure in that will eventually help in, uh, in, in increasing the, the visibility of the, the research output. And also most importantly, the, well, as, as a project partner, TCC Africa being a project partner, we'll, we'll definitely look at this as a great opportunity to increase um, the capacity building within the continent, especially when it comes to increasing awareness on the importance of preprints and particularly Africa Archive. I believe Joe can talk more about the infrastructural bit. Joe, are you there? Uh, hi, I'm here with my little furry buddy. Um, yeah. I'd rather have Obanda say a few more words. Um, Obanda, Is Obanda in? Are you available? Yeah, I'm here. Great, oh, so okay, then. I hope Obanda you can hear me. Oh, great. So, yeah, I, I, we, I, I'm, I'm personally excited uh, for our team, Africa Kai, for uh, being part of the awardees uh, today. Yeah, and um, I'll just say that uh, the award will strengthen our community work to support Africans in making their achievements and results discoverable through open access and appropriate licensing, because that is what we do. Um, and uh, we and also we are looking at the award helping us to settle our expenses in, uh, and also initiate the implementation of our roadmap and gear up um, for subsequent fundraising and strategic partnership building in the African SICOM ecosystem. Yeah, so um, it will help to strengthen our, our infrastructure, which as Joy said um, in the beginning, it was it, it's meant to be decentralized and to serve. Uh, African scholars and research in Africa and about Africa. Now, thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you for, for, for sharing that additional context. Um, we are moving on to Chris Holgraf, if you are there next, uh, representing 2i2c. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. And see you. <laughs> um, yes, I can explain. Yes, okay. Um, I can explain just a little bit about uh, 2i2c and sort of its conception and why it exists in the first place. Um, so it's a relatively young nonprofit organization that came out of sort of the combination of two different um, missions that we've been working towards for several years and some challenges around um, kind of sustainably growing each of those uh, separate missions. So one of them is um, I work quite a lot with a project called Jupiter, which is a large open source community and project that builds open source tools um, and infrastructure for interactive computing. So often it's, it's points where like a human is sort of sitting in front of a screen and is rapidly interacting with the, you know, some kind of computational infrastructure or trying to you know, write a document or collaborate, that kind of thing. 
Um, and Jupyter as a project is very, very impactful. Um, as you know, as an open source project, it's at this point it's used across you know many, many, many different universities and seems to an industry and companies um, all over the place. And at the same time, it's been very difficult to sustain the project. Um, and it, it, the project itself has very little kind of dedicated funding for itself. It's it's all just kind of in-kind donations and pieces of people's time here and there. Um, and so what we're trying to do is play around with different ways that we can sustain and, and provide sort of like dedicated resources for pieces of Jupiter, um, but in a way that like the Looks like we've lost Chris there. Let's see if he comes back in a moment. Otherwise, computing and data limits. Oh. oh, hey, Chris, we, we lost you about 30 seconds ago, but you seem to be back now. Damn it. Um, okay. You were just getting into the stuff. Well, I don't remember what I was talking about before. Morning. Morning. Yeah. <laughs> window? yeah. Okay. Uh, right, right? Okay. Yeah. I can yeah, give you, uh, I can give you spark notes, which is Jupiter, hard to sustain, want to try to help sustain. That was that sums up the last 40 seconds or so of what I said. <laughs> um, so the other the other side of it is at the university, we've been deploying at UC Berkeley, we've been deploying Jupiter infrastructure for about three or four years. Um, and we've done it both for educational use cases and for research use cases. One of the big challenges that we've always run into with this is that you know, our kind of vision is that other community colleges and, and other universities would deploy the same infrastructure for their own, you know, this kind of open source, anyone can use it, you can deploy it anywhere. They would deploy the same kind of stack for themselves. Um, but we found that no matter how many tutorials and workshops and documentation we built, it was just really a non-starter for them to be able to do so. And so, 2I2C's goal is to both provide a pathway towards some kind of sustainability and, and at least a way to generate resources for the open source pieces of, of Jupyter, as well as a way to provide like a more reliable um, source of, for, for lack of a better word, DevOps expertise in like cloud infrastructure around data analytics for both education and research so that either universities or nonprofits or research organizations don't have to hire their own full-time DevOps person in order to, to deploy and operate and maintain this infrastructure. So it's a way of, we, we view 2I2C as a kind of glue organization that can bring together stakeholders in the education space and the research space, as well as on the open source side of things um, to, to be able to help both communities equally. So. The, the funds that we're getting through this, we're going to use towards a, a set of early educational Jupyter Hub pilots. So basically serving Jupyter infrastructure for small scale classes, um, ideally at like community colleges or smaller universities or, or groups around that are scattered around the world to help them um, have that infrastructure for the spring semester of 2021. Um, and, and these funds will cover the, just the cost of running the cloud uh, the, like the cloud hardware, the cloud bill itself, so that they don't have to worry about um, covering that cost somewhere else. Um, and that'll be really helpful in allowing us to develop our own kind of sustainability model and our own collaboration model and figure out how we can help uh, serve these communities more in the future. So I should say as a, as a quick plug, if anybody has an interesting kind of like small scale educational use case that requires interactive data analytics and would benefit from something like shared Jupyter instances for people, then please do reach out um, and I'd be happy to, to chat more about uh, whether we could potentially partner on it. So thanks very much. Cool, thanks, Chris. Um, so Kathleen, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, uh, if you're available now, um, be great to hear a bit more about Humanities Commons. Absolutely, and thank you. I am I am here and available and delighted um, by this award, and am super grateful um, to the J. Ross Rapid Response Fund um, for this support. Humanities Commons has been around for about four years now. It was originally founded by the Modern Language Association um, as uh, an expansion of what had been MLA Commons, which had been a space that was meant for MLA members to engage with one another. Humanities Commons serves now, four years later, 25,000 humanities scholars and practitioners from around the world. 
Um, and we have in this network um, a, a social network space um, connected to a repository that allows scholars not only to deposit and receive DOIs and preserve the work that they're, that they're producing, but also to share that work back with the network and to connect that work with, um, with the scholars that they want to be able to have access to it. Um, Humanities Commons has been a phenomenally successful project from that respect, um, but as we've just heard about Jupiter, it's been very challenging to sustain um, because it's an expensive project. Um, and it's it, one of its founding principles is that the network needs to remain open and free to all participants, regardless of affiliation or institutional um, affiliation or, or society membership or anything like that. So um, in order to keep the, the network open and free, we've been over the last couple of years implementing a sustainability plan that has first um, involved the migration of Humanities Commons from the Modern Language Association to its new host and fiscal sponsor um, at Michigan State University, which is where I'm located. Um, and that migration has now been completed um, and we're now kind of working toward the business model that will allow us to, to develop um, greater sustainability for the network. Part of that business model will always be philanthropic in orientation. Um, we are, are applying for grants in the ways that you know, we always do. And in um, January of this year, we were awarded um, by the National Endowment for the Humanities um, with a significant infrastructure and capacity building challenge grant. Um, the challenge grant portion of, of this requires us to do a three to one fundraising match. And beginning that process of fundraising in January, 2020 was not exactly the ideal moment um, because a lot of the folks to whom we would have gone for support um, have for all of the obvious reasons diverted their funding into COVID related projects and needed to do so. So our process of raising funds has been slowed but that also means that our process of hiring the people that we need to hire in order to sustain and expand the network has been slowed. And so the, the JROST Rapid Response Fund is enabling us to engage a contractor who can help us with some basic upgrades um, that need to be made to the system in order to keep it stable and moving forward in the interim before we're able to get our new technical lead who hopefully will be joining us early in 2021 on board. So thank you for all of that. Um, Humanities Commons is at hcommons.org. We are gonna be expanding quite dramatically in the next year. Um, so I hope you will come and take a look and um, join us. And if you um, are an institution that is looking for um, a, a, a new way to support faculty engagement, both in their fields and within the institution, I would love to talk with you about that. Um, we are piloting a new institutional node on the network with MSU Commons. Um, that's at commons.msu.edu. Um, that I would love to talk with you about. And if you are involved with uh, an academic or professional or other kind of society that could use a communication and collaboration space, um, I would love to talk with you about that as well. So thank you very much. Um, and, and I'm really grateful for the, the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about it. Great, thanks, Kathleen. Um, Leslie? If you're there, and I think I've seen you here, um, I'd love to hear a bit more about the Knowledge Equity Lab. Let's Hi, good chat. morning, afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks to the JOS um, committee for um, providing uh, our initiative, this grant. We're very honored and privileged and particularly happy to be in the company of these other worthwhile projects. I'm a big fan of Humanities Commons and the other projects as well. So I'm very delighted. Uh, the Knowledge Equity Lab uh, sits in the Center for Critical Development Studies at University of Toronto, where I teach. And our university sits on the traditional land of the Huron and Wendek, the Seneca and the Mississauga of the Credit River. Now, uh, 
our university was, my campus was one of the first campus in the 60s to expand beyond the traditional university model. And it was to be one of the first TV-based campus. So the whole campus was built with television in mind and the then satellite technology. I and mean, Marshall McLuhan was a faculty member uh, in the main campus and he was helping us rush in the new global village. Uh, with this TV technology. I bring this up because at that time in the 60s, our university actually invested heavily on infrastructures, building local infrastructures, building TV studios, making sure there's a big uh, cable and, and server rooms and all those kind of things for television. Uh, television didn't turn out very well for the campus, but it's allowed the campus to be ready for fiber optic transition. Uh, but in that transition, uh, what we have not done is invest in local infrastructure. We have spent all our money instead, fast forward, fast forward 60 years on external privatized infrastructure. Now I'm on Zoom every day teaching my classes and my data and the student data are being shipped to Amazon somewhere, somewhere out there. Uh, and none of our infrastructures are locally loan or locally controlled locally designed. I want to put hypothesis into part of my learning management system. I was told to get in line and the fastest they will probably approve it is about 12 months. So as an instructor, uh, I have no say in the kind of tools that I, I use for my daily uh, business. And of course, we spent a lot of time talking about the, the publishing industry and how it has eroded our, our, our autonomy and so forth, and how much money we're spending on the publishing industry. And we haven't been as thoughtful or careful about all the money we're spending on these privatized infrastructures uh, that we're giving away our data and everything at the same time. And I think this is a, a bigger, bigger challenge for us. Uh, and if we wake up after the pandemic, we might not have a lot left for us to be uh, in control of. And so that comes back to the, the, the issue of the, the Knowledge Equity Lab. It is really something we set up as both a research space uh, and a teaching space, but also a, a community gathering space. And the reason for that is that even though we only launched the lab in September of this year, uh, the incubation for that lab has been about 25 years in the making. Uh, and it began with one of our first projects called BioLine International, really experimenting with this thing called the web and how the web could be used to serve scholarly purposes uh, you, based on scholars' needs, uh, particularly scholars from the global south. And we have learned a lot over these last 25 years. Uh, of course, sustainability is the biggest challenge. And as my dean always asked me, sustainability, he said, Leslie, means what's going to happen to your project if you get hit by a truck tomorrow. Uh, and that is really, I think many people can associate with that challenge because a lot of projects uh, based at universities, small scales are really run by a small handful of people putting in their own resources and their time and, 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 uh, and dedication. And if we, we get hit by a truck, the project may not carry on tomorrow. So I'm grateful to this funding because this funding will go toward helping us set up a, a proper sustainability plan so that if I get hit by a truck tomorrow, hopefully we have some way to continue uh, with some of these initiatives. And many of my students, the young researchers, they are the one who is gonna be able to carry these, these idea forward because they understand that the world they live in is very different from the world that I lived in. I was privileged enough to have a permanent job. Most of the students will not see the kind of jobs that we have now in the kind of tenure and, and all these kind of system. And I think we're fooling ourselves into training our students to be like us. So the lab is really a space for students to experiment with different way of knowing and, and doing research particularly with underserved communities uh, around us, but also uh, around the world. And so how do we scale differently? Instead of scaling big, how do we scale horizontally across communities, across different knowledge domains? And how do we create tools that 
uh, allow us to, to design equitable knowledge circulation and system. Uh, tools that we need and we want to use instead of having to get in line to use something that we didn't ask for. And so, uh, sorry to, to be so a little bit, uh, uh, I suppose, passionate about this because I think I'm really at a point at the pandemic where uh, the more I think about it, the, the more I'm concerned that if we continue to think about business as usual, we'll wake up uh, with little uh, left for us to really think about in terms of the futures uh, of the academy. So. Um, I'm gonna shut up here, but again, very thankful for all those who supported our initiatives uh, as shout out to Spark for helping us. But uh, before I shut up, uh, the Bioline International project would not have been possible if not for our uh, partners in Brazil in uh, called CREA. Uh, they're the Biodiversity Center nonprofit. They've been supporting building open data infrastructure in Brazil and Latin America for 30 years. Uh, and it is to people like them that uh, we owe a lot of our thanks. But. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, so our final um, speaker is Marcus Loney, um, who can hopefully tell us a little bit more about SK Time and hopefully tell me if I'm pronouncing the project correctly. Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And yes, it's, it's the correct pronunciation. The name comes from another big um, software package or toolbox called Scikit-Learn. And then if you, if you make it short, it becomes SK-Learn. And we're building on top of that um, and specialize on time series data and hence the name SK-Time. Um, I've actually prepared some um, slides which I want to share. Um, so let me quickly share my screen. Um, earlier today, um, I graduated from the Open Life Science program. So it was easy enough to um, adapt the slides. And the Open Life Science program is um, an open science leadership program. Um, but um, so first of all, I want to say that um, I'm, I'm really grateful for the award. And I want to thank the J. Ross team for creating this funding opportunity. And um, it's not just the, the, as a relatively young project, it's not just the funding which will help us to make our project uh, more sustainable and um, which gives us the time to find um, more long-term funding, but it's also the, the, the recognition that comes with this award for the community effort that has already gone into SK Time. And I'm really looking forward to, to kind of like make use of this award and to further develop and grow our project and community. Now, and I quickly want to say a bit more about what SK Time is, and why we need it, and um, how you can get involved if you're interested. Um, so, SK Time is a is a software package. It's a it's a toolbox, so people can use it to um, run um, um, data analysis um, projects, and it's a modular toolbox, so you can combine different tools from the toolbox to create and pipelines and workflows as is um, kind of standard in, in machine learning research. And the main motivation for creating SK Time is that the current ecosystem um, is, is quite fragmented. So you have all of these um, very specialized toolboxes, I named some of them here, but there isn't really an overarching framework. And the problem is that this makes it really hard for users to, to understand and use and kind of like interoperate these packages. And for developers and researchers, it makes it hard to extend the existing functionality and to integrate their new uh, methods. And our mission with SK Time is to create such a unified framework. Um, and a huge part of this is not just the, the kind of like software engineering challenge of, kind of like organizing all of these methods and algorithm, but it's also the, the challenge of building a connected community and an inclusive community of users, developers, and domain experts who work with the data. And I want to focus a little bit on the, kind of like the second challenge of building um, a, a more connected community. So um, currently in my experience, in many areas, um, the kind of like users, domain experts, and methodology experts are also quite isolated 
which makes it hard to learn from each other and to exchange ideas. And with the help of the, the Turing Way project, which is also based at the Alan Turing Institute and um, the Open Life Science Program, which I mentioned earlier, we have been able to, to build a number of community structures, which kind of like lay a solid foundation for our project. And um, just to kind of like highlight one of them um, is the kind of like the idea of an algorithm maintainer. So this is a, a new community rule, uh, role and um, which we can like clearly acknowledge. And the idea is that this not only makes the, the contributors and their contributions more visible, but it also helps us to get delegate some of the maintenance burden um, by, by kind of like giving the contributors a sense of responsibility um, for the, the kind of continued maintenance of their code. We've also run a number of outreach and onboarding and teaching events and activities in the last um, year. Um, including our own mentorship program and um, a participation in the major leak hacking program and a number of um, really popular um, tutorials at the PyData Amsterdam and the PyData Global. And next year, and this is kind of the third aspect here, the collaboration. Next year, we're planning um, a collaborative workshop at the Applied ML Days conference. And this will be the first joint workshop for um, for, on time series analysis, but um, jointly conducted with different maintainers from three other packages. And we think this is really important to, to bring together the different package maintainers, because in the end, only through, only through discussion and collaboration, will we be able to find a common standard and to make it easier for users and developers um, to use the, the available tools. Um, then, um, so this, this just gives a few kind of like an overview of the different collaborations that we were able to create in the last um, um, year and a half since the, the beginning of our project. And with the award, I'm really looking forward to, to taking to take the project forward and to further support the community. And so yes, thank you again. And if you're interested, um, please reach out. Um, here are some more details how you can get involved and where you can find us. Um, yes, your help is, is extremely welcome. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Marcus. And thank you to um, uh, everyone um, who responded so gracefully to our request to say a few words about your project. A very short notice today, um, but really, really good to have that extra context. Um, there's also a blog has been posted um, whilst this has been going on, announcing all the awardees. So please check that out and share it online. Um, also, um, there is another session where we'll be talking about the awardees later at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we hope to hear from a few more of the projects as well who weren't able to make this session. Now, I am going to hand back to Bianca, um, because, partly because I'm late for a meeting with my boss, but also because she's got some really exciting news to share before we close out this session. So over to Bianca and congratulations again, everyone. Thanks, Ian, and best of luck in your next meeting. Um, yeah, again, also for me, congratulations for all the uh, awardees, and thanks for giving some insight in in uh, your projects. Uh, as Ian mentioned, we have had uh, about 50 applications, and um, IOI also plans to um, to bring the remaining application that we were not able to fund to the attention to uh, of other funders with permission of the of the applicants uh, to be able to see if we can uh, sort of broaden the funding um, possibilities. So if you are a funder, if you know of any funding um, options that that might be relevant for uh, for other applications, please get in touch also with with IOI. But that was not the exciting announcement that uh, that Ian announced. Uh, that's this, another funding opportunity uh, offered by Sage Publishing, who is offering a 5,000 US grant to build an open source tool that will help authors to check if a manuscript has been anonymized before a double anonymous peer review. So I'm really excited for a publisher to putting this out in the open and really asking to build an open source tool. More information about this opportunity is in the Slack channel um, general announcements. And uh, I don't know if Helen King is here from Sage because she's the contact person for any further questions. Um, if Helen's here, then 
well, thanks very much uh, to Sage and to Helen for um, for opening this this opportunity. And with that, we are almost at the end of this session. And for a number of people here, including myself, that means the end of this uh, JWAS 2020. Uh, for a number of other people, you'll have the opportunity to attend uh, later today, the second session with again, exciting breakout sessions and uh, to hear from our other awardees. But for those people who are, for whom this is the end of JWAS, I wanna thank everyone for their participation um, in the sessions, also in the chat, helping each other out uh, I think it was really a great, uh, great experience. The meeting recordings will be made available on the IOR website in January and the IOR Slack will remain open for discussion as well. So I hope to, uh, to be able to continue this discussion with this community. Also want to thank the program committee, uh, Kristen, Danielle, Juan, Ian, Greg, Heather, Dan, Joe, Waym, Caitlin and Vanessa. Uh, for all the work that they've done, especially, uh, well, everyone, but especially Caitlin and Vanessa, who I don't know if they slept at all over these uh, three, three past uh, days. I don't know how. And very special thanks to Vanessa for handling the situation this afternoon with the Zoom. Uh, the Zoom. Thanks so much for, for that. Also, another thanks for our event sponsors, Jan Zuckerberg Initiative, Crossref, Hypothesis, Ithaca, for making this meeting and also making the, the rapid response funds uh, possible. And that's almost a wrap. Um, you may know that, um, that Heather Steins and Jan Dove are hosting uh, a post-event post reception now almost now so go to the slack and uh, see the the link there and if you want to join us there after for the after conference uh, chats uh, kindly sponsored by DOIJ and before that I just want to say one more thing that this year is a year that I think all of us are very happy to see ends uh, a very challenging year but at the same time I think those challenges that have being brought to the fore uh, to the fore by COVID only highlighted uh, some other additional challenges that we are facing, we will be facing also over the next year with climate change, inequity, uh, racism. We'll need each other over the next year. So I would like to ask everyone, please stay safe, take care of each other and hope to see you again. And with that, I think that's a wrap for today. <laughs>